Let's pray. Say, God, I'm open. God, I'm ready. Speak to me now. The next few weeks, we're going to be looking at this subject, a a soul that is satisfied, a a soul that is satisfied. And really what we're going to be looking at and talking in particular about or around this subject is the subject of worship. Someone say worship. Uh, We just had a beautiful time of worship. And so we're really going to be looking at this whole idea of worship and around the the conversation of a soul that is satisfied. I I looked up some different definitions of worship in preparation for today and read, read some different things. One thing said this, that worship is to regard something or someone with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Another place it said this, that worship is when we give our highest praise or deepest affections towards something. In particular, one writing said this, when when it comes to Christian worship or the worship that most of us today, if we are a follower of Jesus, we would say, well, I wanna worship God. They, They explain it like this, that worship is the response of the whole being, heart, soul, mind, and strength to beholding God's glory. That's what worship is, worship. And so we're gonna be talking about a soul that is satisfied, but but in it all, we're really gonna be looking at the subject of worship. I I know today for a lot of us, we we love to to have peace in our souls. Anyone like to have peace in your soul? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, we've got another conversation. I, I mean, everyone, you, you have that desire, right? It, it, you, you would say, man, I, I just want, want my soul, my being to be satisfied. And so what do we do as humans? We've always done it. We, we've all, you can trace just the whole record of mankind. It, it's like all the time we will look for things to satisfy our soul. We, we think, well, if we could, could achieve this or if we could get that, then we would be satisfied. We look at someone else's life and we're like, wow, you know, if I had their life, I would be satisfied. Or we look at someone else's spouse and we're like, if I could have a spouse like they have, I would be satisfied. And it's kind of just been the nature of mankind throughout history. Over and over again, we look for things to satisfy. For some of us, it's a job or career. It's like if I get that job or career, I will be satisfied. If I make that sports team, I'll be satisfied. If my kid makes that sports team, I'll be satisfied. It's always just something else. And and, and well, maybe, well, if I have enough wealth and, and I have enough income, then I will be satisfied. And for many, we turn to substances or we look into relationships and we think, well, this is the place I'll finally be satisfied and over and over and over again throughout the history of mankind what do we see we achieve this and we achieve that and we get this or we get that yet we still have a soul that is dissatisfied I, I want to start today because I, I we always need to make sure we understand this truth of God's word, and I believe the truth that many people that are part of Hope City has found. That is why we entered today, and as we begin to sing uh, about the freedom we have in Christ and all Jesus has done, and, and we are alive just like Lazarus, the, the reason there's an excitement is because we understand and we realize that only Jesus can satisfy the longing of the soul. Anyone today that you could just say, yeah, I believe that, that only Jesus ultimately can satisfy the longing of our soul. I, one of my favorite stories in the life of Jesus when he was here on earth uh, is recorded in, in the Gospel of John. And in particular, this story, the, the surrounding, and I've taught lots about it because it's one of my favorites, but, but we'll see a, a lady in the story, and for her, you could say, as you study her story, that most likely she was looking at relationships to be her satisfaction. It was that over and over again, she would find herself in a relationship, and I'm sure just thinking, well, well this guy's going to be the guy. This is a guy that, that finally is going to make me feel well and, and I'm going to be okay. And, and relationship after relationship, well, one day Jesus was on the road and he would be traveling on his way to Galilee. 
And, and he says that he had to go through Samaria. And I always say it's interesting because when you look on a map, you'll see that that was not the easy way to go. And Jesus only did one thing while in Samaria, and that was meet with this lady. And so Jesus goes this day, and he, he goes to the well, and he'll send his disciples on ahead to go get some food, go to the market, whatever it was. And, and so he's there in the middle of the day, and all of a sudden, this Samaritan lady walks up to the well. It's interesting because she would come alone, and historically, they would always go to the well early in the morning before the, the sun was at its peak and the heat, and they would travel in groups. But this lady in the afternoon, she would come all by herself carrying her jar, ready to fetch some water, and Jesus is sitting there. And Many of you would know historically that I'm so thankful for Jesus because he changes everything. And, and historically at the time, even, even ladies were, were not given the respect that they deserved. Ladies and women were treated kind of as a second class. That was the world that this lady would have known. Not only that, she's a Samaritan and there's this conflict between the Jewish people and Samaritan people. And so all of a sudden she shows up and this is what it says in John chapter 4 verse 7. It says when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? As the disciples had gone into the town to buy some food, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Someone say living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where, where can you get this living water? She, she's looking at him and he's like, hey, I, I, I've got my, my pail. I, I've got my ability. I've got my rope to, to go down. Like, what are you going to use? Like, you, you got a, a longer rope. You got a bigger pail that you're going to get something that I'm not able to get. Like, what are you talking about? Where are you going to get this living water? Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. And so she's letting him know this, this well, this, this, is, this is from our father Jacob. Like th this well is important. Th this well is a big deal. This just isn't any well. And, and you're trying to say that you have something even better? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What was Jesus looking at this lady and letting her know? Only me, only Jesus can satisfy your soul. That if you're looking for substance and you're looking at relationships or you're looking at this or that to satisfy, you will always be thirsty again. But if you could drink the water that I give, you will drink of that living water and never thirst again. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. The question that I want to look at the next few weeks would be this. If that is the case, why do we as Christians often seem, not seem satisfied? You've put your faith in Jesus you believe on him, you are saved, but if we were to be really real with one another today, there's a lot of times and moments in our life that we're not satisfied. Maybe it's just me. But I've had enough conversations with enough of you to, to know that there are moments and there are times that we feel, wait a minute, my soul doesn't seem satisfied. I love Jesus, I put my faith in him, I know that I have this well that would spring up to eternal life, but, but right now, today, or this week, or this month, or this year, I am not satisfied. I believe that it has a whole lot to do 
with our worship. A whole lot to do with our worship. It's interesting because we'll read this story and Jesus is talking to her about being the living water and and all of this and right right away the conversation will shift and you'll almost think, well, wait a minute, this is a whole nother conversation. They're talking about a whole nother subject, but I I personally believe that there is a connection, that, that there's something here. He's saying, I'm the only one that can satisfy. It's just me and right away the conversation will go to worship. Listen to what it says. She says, sir, I can see that you are a prophet. And and as you look back, he's already gone into some of her life story, and this is where he got into her relationships and and all of that, and the husband she's had and the man she's now living with isn't her husband. She says, I can see you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper, someone say true worshiper, will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. And Jesus looks at her and declares, I, the one speaking to you, Am he? She starts to have this conversation around worship. And she's saying, our people, we we understand and we realize historically that this is the place we can come to experience the presence of God. This is the place that we can worship. And then she looks at him and says, you you Jews, you say it's a temple and you've got to go there. And the next few weeks we're going to look at some historical facts of why she would say that. But, But all of a sudden Jesus says, yeah, that was the case. There was a moment that my presence was confined to a certain location at a certain time. But there's a time coming and it is now. And remember, this is after he's talked to her about truly him being the well of living water. And he says it's already here that true worshipers are going to worship in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter where you are. Worship. You see, it is in the presence of the Lord that our souls are satisfied. And we're going to get into it the next few weeks, that it is through worship that we usher in the presence of God. If there was anyone in history that understood what it was to worship God, If there was ever a person that understood worship, if there was ever a person that that truly just understood, you know what, the only way my soul can be satisfied, it is in the presence of my Lord. And that was David. Was David a perfect man of God? This is answer back. No. If you've ever studied the story of David, you realize, wait a minute, this guy actually blew it pretty big. Has an affair, gets a guy killed. (laughs) Like, uh, yeah. Yet even after the fact, he repented, and the Bible would still say he was a man after God's own heart. Amazing. And David understood the presence of his Lord. Psalm 63 says this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul, someone say my soul. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. 
when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. He understood that his soul was satisfied when he got in the presence of his Lord. He understood, and you study his life. I mean, he had a lot of ups, and he also had some downs. And he had life pretty good in a lot of moments, but other times that he would be discouraged. And and you'd wonder, how can you even worship God in this moment? The reason that he could worship God, no matter what life was throwing at him, is he understood the only place my soul is truly satisfied is in the presence of God. A few things I want to talk to you about today. First of all is this, worship must be from the heart. Worship must be from the heart. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus would say, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. John Piper said this, that all true worship is in essence a matter of the heart. It is more, but it is not Less. All worship is a matter of the heart. And we're going to get into it. There are times because our emotions can confuse us sometimes. And, and so there's going to be moments in life where, where our emotions aren't in it. And so sometimes we'll think, well, my heart's not in it. But I would actually argue that, that a heart of a true worshiper will worship God regardless of their emotions. Because their heart is still in it. And they'll say, I'm not even feeling it right now, God, but I'm going to worship you because it is from the heart. I need you to know something today. The Bible, we're going to talk through it this, in this series, but, but the, you know what? Worship is not just the lifting of hands. Again, there are times that we lift our hands because we're going to say, you know what? My worship is going to tell my emotions to smarten up because God is still worthy, Right? And so there are times that you might not feel it, but you'll still lift your hands. But our worship is not just the lifting of our hands. Our our worship is not just the songs that we sing. Our worship is not just the music that we play or listen to. Our worship is not just the dance and whatever else. Our worship is not just the clapping of the hands. Because if that is all your worship is, and your heart's not in it, are you really worshiping? You see, all worship must be from the heart. David understood the place that his soul would be satisfied was when he would worship his God. Not just in song, not just in music, not just in dance, not just the playing of an instrument. But when his heart was worshiping his God. The second thing I need us to know today is this, is that worship is more than what we do on Sunday. Worship is more than what we do on Sunday. This is where I believe so many people can can get confused. The religious people in the day of Jesus, I mean, they kind of knew how to to do the religious thing. And they knew the the service times. And they would set their alarms. And they would make sure they're at the temple when they're supposed to be there. And they knew all the rituals. but, But if there was anyone in Scripture that you would see as Jesus would talk to them whose hearts were far from God, it was a lot of the religious people. Because they knew kind of these motions and kind of schedules and when to do it and honor the Sabbath and this and that. But their hearts were so far from God. And I need you to know something today that worship is more than what we do on Sunday. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 13. It says, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God. Proclaiming our allegiance to his name. So we're like, okay, let's do it Sunday. Woo-hoo! I am having allegiance to Jesus. It is church day. I am going. I am showing up. And I am going to worship. If they play my favorite song and the music just right and the sound just fits my ear and, and all of that. I'm going to pledge my allegiance. We're going to pledge our allegiance as continual sacrifice. And then verse 16, though, listen to what he says. 
the kind of sacrifice that God loves. He says, don't forget to do good. The share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Wait a minute, I thought worship was just what we do on a Sunday morning and when the band plays and that, that 20 minutes, that, that'll be my worship. And, and so here he's writing to the New Testament church and he's saying, hey guys, just continue to worship God and give him praise, a sacrifice of praise. And you want to know what it looks like? It's not just what you do in the temple. It's not just what you do when you're gathered together. It is your life. Your good deeds, your sharing with others, your giving, your sacrifice. Those are the things that pleases God. Hebrews, or sorry, Romans says this, chapter 12, verse 1. So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living. Someone say living. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Wait a minute. I thought worship was all about Sunday morning. I thought this was my worship. But worship is what we do every day of the week. Worship is our life that honors God, that gives God praise and give God thanks. I thank God, and we're going to talk about it. I thank God for the avenues of worship, the instructions he gives us in Scripture on how we can worship physically. But I'm so thankful that when I'm just going about my day and I'm just being a dad or I'm being a husband or or I'm just being a good employee, that I can still be worshiping my God. Because worship is from the heart. The last thing I want to share today is this. Worship needs to be on divided. Someone say on divided. Someone else say on divided. Worship needs to be on divided. I, I, I've just been praying that God would allow me to to communicate this in the right way, the the way that he has placed it on my heart as I was preparing and studying and praying about this week. Because I I want us as the church to to understand what I believe the Holy Spirit would, would say to us. But someone today, you need to know this, that your soul will not be satisfied when your worship is divided. Remember, we're trying to answer the question of why so many Christians so often would say, my soul is not satisfied. And I believe, especially when you look at the church in North America, it is because for a lot of us and a lot of Christians, our worship is divided. We love Jesus, we've experienced his grace, we're so thankful for all that he has done, we, we understand that without him we have no hope at all, but yet we still are going through life and so often we find ourselves in places and moments where we just don't seem to be satisfied. And I've got a question today and I've just got a feeling that one of the reasons is because our worship is divided. When you read about the, the churches, you read about the end time church, which all of us would be a part of, of one of those churches essentially. I'm going out of order, media team, but we read something in the book of Revelation and when you read it, you actually would think like, whoa, wait a minute, this, this is pretty harsh for our Lord. This, this sounds pretty, pretty intense. Like, wait, wait a minute here. Like, this is, this is our Lord, his grace and his mercy that it would show up and talk to the Samaritan woman and tell her all about him being the living water. And if you have this living water, you'll never thirst again. And then we're reading about churches 
in days to come in the book of Revelation, and it will say these words. And if you grew up in church or you grew up in a youth group in my day and age, this was like the go-to scripture. It says this, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is the Lord speaking. Now the translation is that, that since you're lukewarm and you're neither hot nor cold, I, I, would, I would rather, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And so when I was a kid in youth group, I was just like, oh my goodness, God's gonna spit me out of his mouth because I, I haven't been just living so perfect this week. And, and I would think like that, but I believe there's a reason that we would see that. And, and we actually see this idea and this thought throughout, throughout scripture. Corey, you can come on back and start playing. Different places will actually see this concept and you would look at it and you would think, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? One place we would see it in a scripture that if you've ever read the Bible, you've ever been in church, you've probably heard these verses, but it's recorded in Joshua and, and we'll see that the Israelites, bottom line, this is Cole's notes, very simplified, but, but the bottom line is the Israelites, God's people, are basically at a stage and point in their life where they are desiring the culture in which they live. They're, they're allowing their, their worldview to be shaped by culture and not by their God. They're, they're at a place in their, their life where, where they're actually starting to experience some, some miserable situations but not even recognizing why they might be facing them. Or you could say it was a moment in time in the Israelite life that their heart was divided in worship and as a result the bottom line is their souls were not satisfied and they were beginning to worship false gods and this is where Joshua would be recorded with this famous saying he says but if serving the Lord's seems undesirable to you. He just got done talking to them about being faithful to the Lord and all these things. He said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Like, he, here's your options. You, you, you guys are wanting to go this way and this seems to be sort of the trend and, and you think this, this is going to be all right, then, then you just got to make up your mind. Are you going to serve them? But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You kind of see this similarity in the book of Revelations when it says, the Lord would say that, I don't want you to be, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. It's amazing because the people of God throughout history, it's kind of like it just repeats itself and you'll see the same kind of thought process show up over and over again. And another place we'll see it, it's absolutely incredible it's in First Kings, and, and this is a time, again, we're not getting deep into the stories today, but, but basically the land has been in a famine about three and a half years. The, the prophet has basically, prophet Elijah has basically been off the scene for this time, kind of just fleeing, hiding for his life king and wanted him dead and he'd gone searching for him. And, and so this drought is in the land three and a half years famine and no rain, nothing. And, and this is around the story where, where Elijah would actually see probably one of the greatest miracles that, that God ever performed on this earth. He literally in front of the, the, the king and, and all these worshipers of Baal, he would actually call fire from heaven in the middle of this drought and then the drought would end and rain would come. But before the miracle, he gathers the people of Israel. gets them all together I got a feeling that for Elijah he not only saw the drought in the land the famine in the land but I got a feeling he began to look at the people of God and he saw the drought and the famine in their souls A 
while all of the world was experiencing physical drought, he looked at the people of God and recognized and realized there's something off in their spirits. before one of the greatest miracles he would look at the people of God and he would say how long will you waver between two opinions if the Lord is God follow him but if Baal is God follow him Again, this is why I've been praying that you would understand or, or hear the, the Holy Spirit today, not confuse it. I, I'm not saying that no matter what's going on in your life, you shouldn't show up to church and worship. I, I'm not saying any of that. I, I'm, I'm not saying, you know what, that, that you know, just, just if you're not really living for God, you shouldn't be at church. That's not at all what I'm saying. Do not misunderstand me. But remember, we're talking today about why so many even Christians will go through life and still kind of feel like their soul is unsatisfied. Could it be because our worship is divided? I've got a feeling why even in the book of Revelation that the Lord would say that I'd rather you be one or the other. I've just got a feeling one of the reasons is because, and even why Joshua would say it or or Elijah would say it is because that the sooner that you actually would recognize and realize, see the problem with a lot of Christians, because God is still God. God keeps all his promises. And so you can come to church and you can worship God and do you know what? God will still receive your worship no matter what you did all week. No matter how far you were from God all week, no matter what you put before him all week, you come into, the, into a, a church service or a gathering and you begin to worship God, God is still gonna receive that worship. And so what happens though is, is for a lot of us, we, we come in and it's like we just get enough of God that, that it's like, okay God, you're still there and you're with me, but then all week what? We worship anything and everything but our God. Through our time, our resources, our thoughts, what we fill our minds with, our conversations. And I believe in Revelation why the Lord would say this is because the the sooner you actually would, would just be over here, you would recognize you would realize that the sooner, see, once you've actually experienced the living God and you've experienced him in your life, all of a sudden, if you actually chase after other stuff, you realize, oh my goodness, nothing satisfies like the Lord. But what can happen? It's like, we're over here worshiping these gods, following after this and forming this worldview. And then then on Sunday, we come to God and we worship God and we receive his grace and mercy. And so it's like, okay, but then over here, we're trying to wrestle through the same stuff again. I'm just telling you, you're going to have a soul that's unsatisfied, most miserable. Today, I simply have a question. Is there anyone in this room? Is there anyone at home today that you would say, I want to worship my God with all of my heart? with all of my mind, with all of my strength, and all of my soul. Is there anyone today that you would say, yeah, I want to. I'm not saying, are you doing it? But you would say, I I want to. Is there anyone today, this this is a hand raised moment. Those of you that would say, I want to worship my God wholeheartedly, undivided, I I want you right now, if you're able, to stand to your feet. There's a couple reasons I believe in Scripture why the Bible would tell us about lifting our hands and And one of the reasons is because it's actually just a sign of surrender.
We're going to talk about it in the next few weeks, but when we come into church or, we, or wherever we are and we begin to worship with our expression, worship God the way he said you should worship him, that he shows up, but those that raise your hand already, I'm just wondering if there's some people that will lift their hands just in surrender right now. Say, Lord, I, I want to worship you undivided. Lord, I, I recognize that only you can satisfy my soul. And Lord, so often, so often I put other stuff way far ahead of you. And then I wonder, why am I so torn? Why does my soul just seem to be longing? Lord, in this room today, we lift our hands and surrender to you. Lord, we just make a declaration in this room and rooms all over the place today. That Lord God, we want our worship to come from our heart. Lord, we don't want our worship to just be what we do on a Sunday. But Lord Jesus, we want our worship to be on, divided all the days of our life. In Jesus' name. I hope today's talk was encouraging to you. And hey, we would love to hear from you of how God spoke to you through this talk. And again, you can message us on Facebook. Make sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hope City F10. You can reach out on our website, myhopecity.cc. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all the content coming out. And we are excited to see how God is going to continually move through your life through this. Love you guys. Have a great day.